I hope tonight is both enjoyable, informative, and perhaps something that you could contemplate and reflect on when you're home. I do give homework, by the way. Yes, you will get, you will get homework, yes. <laughs> anyway, we're here to rediscover the riches of Vatican II. I am not going to ask any of you if you were alive <laughs> during Vatican II, but I am going to ask those who were not alive to raise their hands. If you were not alive in 1962, if you were born after 1962, then you have to listen to the rest of us. The 60s were a turbulent time. We had the Vietnam War, the flower children, bebop. We had the assassinations of President Kennedy and his brother Robert Kennedy. And we also had the, um, the effort and the strife for racial independence and interdependence. It was a difficult time, and there was one man who realized that we, as Christians, are compelled, or were compelled, to do something to bring life and hope and peace, not just into the United States or into the little towns we live, but in the world. We know, of course, that man was Pope John the 23rd. And we're going to talk about Pope John the 23rd. But before we do, I think you might know everyone at your table, but I would like for you to take a few minutes at your table and share with one another, why are you here? Why are you here? And what do you hope to hear? What do you hope to listen, to learn? What do you hope to appreciate? So I'm going to ask all of you for one minute, 30 seconds, to look at those questions. Why are you here? Certainly not to get away from the cold. You had to leave the nice warm home to come here. But why are you here, and what do you hope to go home with? What do you hope to learn? What do you hope to hear? What do you want to go home and appreciate that you didn't appreciate? So let's take one minute of silence just to give yourself the opportunity to look at these two questions and to answer them in your heart. Well, you will hear the positive, and I might give you a smidgen of the negative. <laughs> However, for me, the Vatican, Second Vatican Council was a miracle. And it had to have been guided by the Holy Spirit. No human being could have ever, ever thought that a council, a meeting, would be so effective in the entire world, not just the Catholic world, the Christian world, and many other traditions as well. I was, uh, I, I was, my first year in the convent when it was Vatican II. And like all of you, what's that? It's a big meeting. Oh, meeting. You know? But it was a big meeting. And for those of us who lived during Vatican II and before, might be able to uh, compliment what you experienced then and if you weren't living then, I was, so I'm going to share with you. But I remember saying to, you know, younger people um, in high school, college, my younger family, you have no idea what Vatican II did for us. You have no idea what the church was when we were growing up. So to help those who had no idea, I'm going to share some of my experiences with you, and I know many of you are going to also say, yep, me too. First of all, whether you went north, south, east, or west in the world, mass was celebrated in Latin. The priest did his job as presider, and we in our pews prayed our rosary. 
or we had the Missal of St. Joseph and we would try to follow in English. But everything was in Latin. On Sundays, the gospel was in English. And then we had a sermon after the gospel. That was the only English part. If you were in France, the only French part would have been the gospel and the homily, the sermon. Of course, since the mass was in Latin, all of music was in Latin. Did we know what we were singing? No. We just knew that we were praising God and giving God honor and glory. And sometimes through a song, beseeching God's love in the trials that we have in life. So, again, we didn't know what we were singing, but we knew that the Spirit of the Lord accepted our song. We also know that when we went into church and it was time for Mass, the priest had his back to the congregation facing the altar. None of us knew what he was mumbling about <laughs> because it was in a whisper. It was in a whisper, so we just heard the psh -psh. Fasting at midnight. Oh my goodness, I remember going out on Saturday <clears throat> evening and rushing home to have something before bed because if I got up in the morning, I couldn't have anything to eat until I went to Mass and I went to 9 o'clock Mass. So it was fasting both from water, any other kind of drink, and food. When we think of the sanctuaries, even as the one that we have, the sanctuary was for the clergy only. And no one could go into the sanctuary except the altar servers. And I might as well say the altar boys, because there were no altar girls, right? Only the clergy, only the priest, not even the altar servers could proclaim the word. And the word was in Latin, except on Sunday, it was in the native language in which we lived. There were no lay lectors. There were no Eucharistic ministers because we trooped up to the um, altar rail. We put our hands in a form of prayer. We lifted our eyes and we pulled out our tongue and received the body of Christ. And we knelt. The communion rail separated the clergy from the people in the congregation. It was a barrier. Yes, we knelt at it to receive Eucharist, but it was a barrier that said, you cannot go beyond this area. Even those who got married could not step onto the sanctuary floor. Kneeling before Holy Communion with the tongue, and then when we wanted to go to confession, I remember going in like this because it was dark mm -hmm. until the priest would open up the window <laughs> and I would hope he wouldn't recognize me. <laughs> so to our young ones who were not living at that time or were too young to appreciate it, you can understand when all this happened in a matter of four years, there were all kinds of emotions going on. People like myself, I was excited. The altar was going to be, I could hear the priest, I could see the priest, we could pray together. That was a gift of Vatican II, participation of the congregation in the sacrifice of the Mass. And yet there were others who were not very happy, very angry. Why do we have to change? It was always like this. But it wasn't always like that. And so what Vatican II did, and this is for a couple of other evenings, it went back to the early church. It scraped up the wisdom and the legacy of the early church, of the middle-aged church, of the pre-Vatican church, and brought what could feed our people, what could feed us spiritually, the foe to the pro. 
And so why did everybody change? Oh, another change is that the tabernacle was not to be in the back of the altar. The tabernacle was to be reserved with the Blessed Sacrament in it in a separate room for adoration. It took a long time before we did that. So normally speaking, to this day, the tabernacle ought not to be in the sanctuary, but ought to be reserved in a room especially formed and dressed, if I might say that, for prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. So the Vatican, too, did more than all of this that I'm sharing with you. And as we go through our second, third, and fourth week, we're going to look at the documents that came forth from Vatican II. Now, we can't, find, we can't do all the documents and all the new um, rituals and ways of praying, et cetera, that came into life. That would take us 10 sessions. We only have four. But what I want to do as we go along is to highlight what affects us in the pew. Highlight what difference does it make for me, for you, of what happened and what came out of and what was mandated or suggested by Vatican II. Okay? Now you're going to say, Vatican II, what happened to Vatican I? Vatican I was in 1881, and we're going to address that next week. But there are only two such ecumenical councils. Vatican I, which never finished because of the Persian Gulf, not Persian Gulf, the Persian Franco-Persian War in France, it never finished. All the participants of this council were sent home. So th that work was left undone. However, for Vatican II, it began in 1963 to 1962 was the opening and the closing was 1965. So, four years, and all that happened, we're gonna fit in four weeks. So put on your good boots when you come next week. Be sure to have something to sustain you to enjoy while you eat, because we're gonna to have to work hard. But I do want to share with you the goal of the Second Vatican Council as Pope John articulated it. He said, this council is to renew ourselves. And he's talking to the bishops and cardinals, remember. So now you're all imaginary bishops and cardinals. And you're hearing him speak. And he says, to renew ourselves and the flocks committed to us so that there may be radiant before all people the lovable features of Jesus Christ, who shines in our hearts that God's splendor may be revealed. That was the ultimate purpose, that God's splendor may be revealed through each one of us as we fall more deeply in love with God. And how do we form all deeply in love with God? By learning more and more who God is for me, for you, for all of us. Pope John XXIII was quite a big man, not only physically, but he had a big heart, particularly for the poor, for the children, for those sufferings with illness. And he had all them in mind when he thought of such an event as the Second Vatican Council. He knew he couldn't do it alone. And so he prayed to Our Lady, who not yet was proclaimed patroness of the United States or of North and South America, but he prayed to the Immaculate Mother of Jesus and our Mother. He prayed to St. Peter, Jesus' apostle who became what we might say our first priest. And he prayed to St. Paul, the great teacher in the early church. And in fact, he prayed to all the saints in heaven, canonized or not, that they would be with him and with all who would be preparing for this council. And he sent an invitation to unexpected people. He not only sent an invitation to the Catholic world to help prepare for it, but he sent an invitation to the entire Christian world. That was new. That was ecumenical. 
that didn't exist yet. But in realizing that we are all one family and we are all children of God, Pope John sends this letter and says to his priests and bishops and cardinals and to sisters and to lay people. Dear brothers and sisters and beloved children, we announce before you, certainly trembling with a little emotion, put together with humble decisiveness purpose, the name and a proposal of a double celebration, a diocesan synod in Rome and an ecumenical council for the universal church. We're going to leave the diocesan synod alone for a while. We kind of got used to the word. We didn't know the word up until about a year or two ago. But it's a gathering of the faithful. It's a listening of one another. It's examining the depth of God in our lives and our lives in God. It's the how-to in this small community. On the other hand, the Second Vatican Council was the entire world. So before we go to Rome, before we enter the Basilica of St. Peter and participate in the Second Vatican Council, imaginatively, of course, we need to acquaint ourselves with the man who was brave enough, faith-filled enough to believe this was possible. So I want to just show you this. When Pope John XXIII announced that there would be an ecumenical council, Second Vatican Council, Vatican II, three names for one piece. He knew it would take much preparation, not just from the Curia or those who were in Rome, but for women and men, religious, clergy, and lay throughout the world. And I do remember the prayer that we prayed every day before the council, during the council, and with gratitude after the council. So who is this man? This man is Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli. Angelo Giuseppe, Joseph. That was his father's name. He was born on November 25, 1881, in a little town of the Diocese of Bergamo, Italy, and Bergamo, Italy would be northeast. I have to figure out, I'm, I'm going backwards to you, northeastern Italy. He was the fourth child and the first son of his parents' 13 children. His father's name was Giovanni Battista Roncalli, and his mother's name was Mariana Mazzola. They were Italian. <laughs> yes. He attended elementary school. They had elementary school in those days. Interesting. He attended a parish elementary school until he was 12. Now, this will blow your mind. At the age of 12, he felt a calling to priesthood. 12. Anybody have a son? or a daughter 12 years old at the present moment? No one? Anybody know a 12-year-old at the present moment? Okay, so I see a few hands up. At 12 years of age, he entered the seminary in Bergamo. At 12 years of age. Can't imagine that, but he did. And the poor thing, he suffered from homesickness. He had 12 brothers and sisters, his mom and dad, to say nothing about uh, Nona and Noni, grandma and grandpa. And there he was in this institution, preparing for priesthood, preparing to serve God's people. He was homesick. He also felt he wasn't very smart. It seemed as though the other boys or young men in his classes were brilliant and he admired their brilliance, but he always felt he didn't know enough, not enough as the others did. And so he would tend to compare himself to his classmates. That didn't do much good for his bravery, for his trust in himself, so he learned to trust in God. 
He completed his studies in Rome after his seminary years in Bergamo. And he loved, he found out that he loved to study. And what he loved most was history. And had I met him on the street, I would have said, hey, Pope John, I love history too. <laughs> and that's why I'm here. His sense of history confirmed for him the hope that God, who has been with God's people always, is now with God's people and will continue to be. He was ordained a priest on August 10th in 1904. Any of us alive in 1904? No. He studied canon law, and then after that, instead of going to the parish to serve, as in those days they called it a curate, and he longed to be a curate. He longed to be a, a priest in a parish. But instead, he was asked to be secretary for the Bishop of Bergano. Nine years. But that nine years gave him first experience of the problems of the world and of the church. And it gave him cause for meditation, contemplation, and the question, what do you want of me, Lord? In 1915, during World War I, he was called to serve in the army, Roman army. He was called to serve as chaplain. He was called to serve as a stretcher keeper, picking up the wounded from the grounds and would buy stretcher with another, bringing them to where they be, be, could be cared for. In 1925, he became an archbishop. Again, he didn't want to be an archbishop. He just wanted to be a parish priest. But he became an archbishop. And he was sent to Bulgaria. And while he was in Bulgaria, he experienced a completely different culture than what he grew up in, what he knew in his native Italy. But he wanted to learn, and he was willing to learn from the people. And so he would go to their homes, and he would sit with them with, I don't know if it was a cigar or a cigarette or a pipe, but certainly was, it was with wine. And he would learn from them what life was like for them. And he would learn for them what they yearned for from the church. And he would go back and he would write in his journal he would write every day in his journal because that helped him to realize that this little country of Italy that he lived in was so small he had no idea what happened in the rest of the world. Well, after nine years, he was transferred from Bulgaria and he was assigned to Greece and Turkey. Don't ask me how he could do that, but he was assigned as an apostolic delegate to uh, Turkey and Greece. And in Istanbul, he set up an office, not for the prelates to come, but for the common folks to come and talk to him. Again, what are their longings? What are their yearnings? What are their needs? And he kept writing in his journal, what can we do? What can we do? One thing he did do, that he got ousted out pretty fast, was that they had mass in Latin, but none of them knew Latin. They, were, they spoke Greece, Greek, or Arabic. And so he started celebrating mass in Greece. In Greece. And somebody squealed, and it got to Rome, and he was in big trouble. And he t was told that he could no longer do that, and he fought. He fought because it was important for him that the people who were gathered together in faith to worship our God, to receive the body and blood of Jesus, ought to do it in their native language. So in 1944, he was now sent to Paris. Paris was in the midst of World War II. The churches were neglected. People were afraid to go to churches. How could people Pray, how could they feel the tender love of God? Once again, he started going to the homes of the people in the dark, that he would not be caught. 
in 1953. He was 71 years old and he thought, oh God, I've done enough now, I'm going to retire. <laughs> and instead, he was made the um, Cardinal Patriarch of Venice. I could just see him in a gondola. <laughs> but anyway, so he was there nine years. And um, while he was there, he thought those would be his last years. And he lived that way. He didn't live that way of just sitting back and watching television, of which there was none, or reading or playing cards with the other men. But he wondered what life could be for him as he retired. So he began living as a retired man. And what he did was he went out to the streets and he said, buongiorno, uh, what else in France? Um, what the heck is it in French? I know it. Bonjour. And people just loved him. They flocked to him. He, he had a heart as big as he was. In 1958, he was called to Rome to participate in the conclave who would elect a new pope after Pope Pius XII's death. Anybody remember Pope Pius XII? Few of us do. We, see, we're not telling you how old we are, but a few of us do know that um, when Pope Pius XII died, it was, her, it was sad. It was, a, it was as though there was a shroud placed over the whole world. He went to the conclave with the certainty that he was going to return to Venice. That's where he wanted to retire. And instead, he never got to Venice at all. He was elected pope. Why would they elect him pope? He was radical. He did things that were not yet in tune with the church. He dared to have mass in a native language of the people he was with. He went around and he talked to people casually, not necessarily with his collar on either, I presume. He was so real, and people loved him. He took the name John after his father, after John the Baptist, and after John the Apostle. And he prayed very much to all three that he would be worthy of their name. I think he was. Now you might ask why in the world did the conclave at that time elect a man of 71 years old? Uh, in, in, uh, at this time, I want to say in 1968, 58, 71 was old. Now it's young. <laughs> but 71 was old. And the poor man, he, he just, you know, he had given so much of his life in so many different areas of the world. And now he just wanted to rest with his fellow Italians in Venice. Well, the cardinals and the bishops that were present for the conclave, as they call that meeting of electing, <clears throat> they wanted a safe hope. <laughs> They wanted to elect an old pope who wouldn't be living very long. And that would give them time to find a good pope. What they found out is that Pope John the 23rd wasn't safe at all. <laughs> he called for, he immediately after his election, he called for reform of the canon law. That's the law of the church. It hadn't been reformed in years. He established a diocesan synod in Rome where the people would come together much the way we did here when we had the synod just a couple of years ago. And he announced there would be a second Vatican Council. Second Vatican Council? Good gracious, are you crazy? There's an Italian, anybody here Italian that speaks Italian? Well, when somebody wasn't all there, we would say, doozy bots, <laughs> you know? And that's probably what they thought about him. But nonetheless, they found he was a different kind of pope. He wasn't straight and formal as 
Pope Pius XII was. He was casual. He was affectionate. He was loving. He had a listening heart. He might not have been as intelligent as his classmates back in seminary, but his school was the education he received by the different roles as a priest he had in Bulgaria, in Greece, in France, in Italy. He learned through experience. He captivated the hearts of almost everyone. And he was welcomed not only by the churches that are Catholic, but he was welcomed by the churches of other denominations and other traditions. And in fact, if you remember, and I do, now I was teaching, Pope Paul the, Pope, um, let me see, Pope Paul, no, not Paul, John the 23rd, I'll say, he welcomed the chief, what do you call the chief of, um, Archbishop of Canterbury, to come to his home for a meal, to come to the palace. They never stepped foot in Rome or in the Vatican since King Henry VIII. But the barrier was broken out of love. And then when he heard that the bishop or archbishop of the Anglican Church in the United States was coming to Rome, he invited that person to come and to break bread with him. And what he said to the prelates, to the priests, to the bishops and cardinals who were dismayed with who he was welcoming into the Vatican, he said, whether they wish it or not, these people are our brethren. They cease to be our brethren only when they stop praying our Father. We are all children of one God, our Father. <laughs> now, he did something during the um, first session of the Vatican Council that they were, the priests and the bishops and the cardinals, they were astounded. They were just amazed. But there used to be the sedia chair. You know, that Pope would sit on the chair, and, and there'd be four strong men who would hold, and he walked around so he could see everybody and bless everybody. He opened up the Second Vatican Council by walking down that big aisle. Just an ordinary common man. I'm not better than you, he would say. We are both the same, and we are both loved by God, differently, but just as intently. At the end of an appearance, um, he loved to go on the balcony and wave to everybody. <laughs> and at the end of the council, people wanted to hear what he thought about the council first session. I should say, the council had four sessions in three years. The first council at the end of it. So people gathered in St. Peter's to listen to him share his experience of that first session. And then it got dark. And he was concerned about the people going home. So what he said to the people in the mist was, he told them to go home because it was late, have something to eat, and kiss their children. Kiss their children. And I dare say that there are stories that he would sneak out at night with ordinary clothes of an ordinary man, and he would go and play card games with some of his friends in Rome. He was so real. So his wit and his spontaneity endeared himself to most people, especially to journalists. And one journalist that met him said, Holy Father, how many people work in the Vatican? And the Holy Father looked at him and said, oh, no more than half of them. <laughs> Didn't condemn anybody, but no more than half of them. And what was a surprise to me that I never knew, of course, the, the Cuban crisis was in 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, around that time. 
I never knew he intervened with Castro. I never knew that. But it was through his efforts and the efforts of others that the crises with Cuba had ended. I never knew that. But after that, what he tended to do was he was going to write an encyclical and encourage and ask people, women, men, and children, of all denominations, no denominations, to seek for peace, to be people of goodwill. He called that encyclical Pacem and Terum, which means peace on earth, peace on earth. Because he knew he didn't know as much as the theologians, he would invite theologians to come and talk to him about separate issues, and he would listen to them. That's what a synod does. It listens. We listen to one another, just listening. And as he listened to no matter whether it was small or large, whether it was a child or an adult, he listened, giving the other person the dignity of being a child of God. So one day, to the bishops of the council, Pope John said, let us look at each other without mistrust. Let us meet each other without fear. Let us talk to each other without surrendering principle. In other words, I have my opinion, you have yours. I have my way of life, you have yours. But I must respect yours as you must respect mine. Of course, as my father would say, I have an opinion and you have a right to your opinion, but of course mine is right and yours is wrong. <laughs> my, fa my father would say that. And so we want to look at this saintly man on his deathbed, he had strived to create a council that would change the world, and it did. It still does. And what he, has, what he said on his deathbed was, it is not that the gospel has changed. It is that we have begun to understand it better. Those who have lived as long as I have were enabled to compare different cultures and traditions and we know that the moment has come to discern the signs of the time, to seize opportunity, and to look ahead. And that is how he did begin the Second Vatican Council. Now, the Second Vatican Council wasn't in the mind of the cardinals and bishops and priests in Rome at all, and I might say seminarians as well. Anyway, on the Feast of St. Paul, outside the walls, and it's called that because the church, the basilica, is actually outside the Roman walls, they celebrated a big mass on his feast day. And so after mass, of course, the clergy were circling around the pope, you know, wanting to talk with him, etc. And he caught their attention and he said, I have something to tell you. We are going to have a Vatican Council, an ecumenical council, because there would be folks from Christian communities there too, not necessarily Catholic. And you know what these older men looked at each other and thought, he must be nuts, right? Anyway, one among them said, but your holiness, it would take years, 20 years for us to prepare for the Second Vatican Council. And Pope John just looked at him and said, I'm an old man. I give you two to four years. <laughs> it took four years. It took four years. So who is this man and what is the spirituality? Can you see, as I'm sharing this humanness of him, coming to life when we realize what we have today and how it was rooted. His, his spirituality was rooted in the love of the Lord. His commonness, he was a common person. He wasn't a man who showed off his prestige. He could have, but he didn't. 
but his commonness was his secret of his spirituality, which endeared himself to people of all ages, of all races, of all creeds, and of all cultures. It characterized his love of God. He felt that love was given to us to be connected to one another and that no one is loved less than the other. That's quite encouraging, isn't it? Now, humor was inescapable for Pope John. Um, his, with, even with his adversaries, he would say funny things in a funny way, and the barrier of stress would just disintegrate. But he was humorous about himself, and he always remained unpretentious. And there is a story that when the head rabbi from Jerusalem came to meet Pope John XXIII at the Vatican, there was a frenzy among those that were in charge of Vatican protocol. There was a door, and it probably was half of that door, or half of that door. And they realized both the Pope and the rabbi could not go through this door at the same time. <laughs> and they didn't know what to do, you know? And there was no protocol, so they had to want, make one up. So one among them went to Pope um, John and said, Your Holiness, who shall go through this passageway, through this doorway first? You or the rabbi? And Pope John answered, Well, Old Testament comes before the New. <laughs> that ended their quandary. The rabbi went first, right? <laughs> and as I said before, when the, uh, one of the priests or bishops who was there when he announced the uh, Vatican, when he uh, said, you know, I'm an old man, I'll only give you two to four years, they were not happy. And in fact, during the time of preparation, one among them came, probably it was like the second or third year, and uh, we need more time. I give you two months. <laughs> he knew he had to have it. Anyway, charity was also the highest virtue by which he lived because his love of God was evidenced in his love for others, all others. And he cultivated this quality in himself from the time he was a child, which says to me he learned it from his parents and grandparents. His trust, his completely trust in God, empowered him to believe that God is always with him and that no matter what God would ask of him, God would give him the grace he would need to fulfill it. He never doubted. He never doubted that God was with him. The image of the cross, Jesus on the cross, was very dear to him. And it is said that every evening, as he went to his room and prayed before this cross, reviewing the day, what were the gifts, what were the trials, what were the confrontations, what were the happy moments. He did this all before the Lord because all comes from God and all returns to God. And so he found wisdom in his own life by being honest with himself. He acknowledged his weaknesses, and he wanted others too. He acknowledged his goodnesses, and he wanted to, others to do that as well. And there is a story that's very dear of when he went to Regina Chaley Prison in Rome one time, a men's prison. All the prisoners were standing in a straight line, and he went to each one and embraced them and said something to them. But when he got to a certain man, a certain prisoner, that prisoner went back and said, No, Holy Father, you can't touch me. I'm a murderer. And with that, Holy Father went to him and embraced him so hard for so long they both cried. And the murder said to him, this is the happiest day of my life. And John said to him in return, mine too, <laughs> mine too. So you can see 
the spirit as we go through the um, Vatican Council, you could see through the spirit that didn't come out of a jack-in-the-box, the idea, but it came out of his lived experience with and for God, with and for others, and how important it was for others, all others, to know this God in their daily lives in an intimate way. And so we have documents, decisions, suggestions that come forth from Vatican II. So let's look at this a moment. What we have just done is to look at the beginning, the beginning of Vatican II, because it convened on that feast of St. Paul outside the walls. Good Pope John initiated. He initiated hope in the future. He initiated wonder and curiosity in the future. He invigorated volunteers to join him in the quest to make the church holy as God means it to be. A holy man, a good man, a simple man who carried a very large um, sense of responsibility on his part. Unfortunately, Pope John XXIII never saw beyond the first session of Vatican II. Shortly before the first session, he found out that he had cancer, pancreatic cancer. And still, he wanted to work for it. And still, he was working on his Episcopal epistle, Pachem and Terry's speech on earth. It didn't stop him from giving his last ounce of energy to his God. And so, when we look at the Second Vatican Council, we have to look at who was behind it. And it was this simple man who lies, whose body lies under an altar in St. Peter's Basilica. He died on June 3rd in 1963, and he was canonized by Pope Francis on April 27th in, 19, in 2014. We say he never lived to see the three remaining sessions of Vatican II, but I think he was there the whole time. I don't think he would have abandoned the very people he had called together. And so we have to thank God for a man who was as brave, as simple, as trusting in Pope John. Also, truth was very important to him. One thing he couldn't stand or take or accept was when someone did not speak the truth about himself or herself or others or a situation. He believed that truth marked the uh, depth of spirituality in the sense of a light, that truth brings light. And so if he wanted people to speak the truth about themselves, he also knew he had to speak about it himself. And again, we go to a journal of a soul. That is his journal. It's a great book. It's this thick. But it's a beautiful book of one man and his intimate relationship with God. Needless to say, faith was his strongest thread that enveloped all the other characteristics of his spirituality. He was called Good Pope John, and I think that's a beautiful compliment to give him. Not wise or intellectual, or good worker, just Good Pope John. And as I said, he died on June 3rd in 1963 at the age of 81 years old. And so there we have him resting in peace, but I have a feeling that he's resting with all of us. And he's probably a little shy because we're talking about him. <laughs> but anyway, why am I spending so much time on him? Because his life and the virtues 
and the accomplishments and his um, reasons for doing what he did when he did it all came together and created something bigger than himself, something bigger than all the priests, bishops, cardinals, etc. in the entire world. Jesus is my Lord and Savior, he would say, and so Jesus was. We only have a few minutes left to our evening. It seemed to go by so fast. But I would like to give each of you at your table, if you wish, to share one thing you heard tonight that touched your heart or one thing tonight that you learned. Okay? So it's going to be five minutes, so no responses. You just say your little bit and then we'll come back together for closure, okay? All right, five minutes. What did you, something you learned, something you heard, something that touched you. Time is up. You can keep talking as you walk out. But we're going to take a swift journey to Rome before we leave, and we're going to go into the Basilica of St. Peter and we're going to learn about Vatican II in four minutes. Yeah. In just four minutes, we're going to outline why the Second Vatican Council was called, who was there, what they decided, and how it changed the church. So we better get cracking. Ecumenical councils, or meetings of all of the bishops, are super rare. On average, they happen once every hundred years. They're always called as a response to a crisis or a question. So what was the big deal facing the church in 1959 when John XXIII decided to call a council? In a word, modernism. The world was rapidly changing after World War II in terms of science and culture and ideas about what it means to be human. How was the church going to relate to this new world? The church wasn't in decline, in fact it was booming, but John XXIII expressed a desire to open the windows and let in some fresh air in terms of new ideas and energy. How would the church remain relevant and dynamic in this changing world? There were some new theological ideas that needed to be addressed as well, but they're a bit too technical for this video. So, who was there? Two popes led Vatican II because, well, John XXIII died in 1963, one year in. Paul VI took it to conclusion. They were joined by around 2,000 bishops and leaders of major Catholic orders. These guys made the big decisions. They were assisted by a bunch of theological experts, mainly priests. Alongside all these guys, a number of lay people, including 20 women, were brought in as auditors and advisors. Finally, non-Catholic Christians were invited to observe, including Orthodox and Protestant Christians. So, what did they decide? I'm only going to give a few highlights here because, well, they came up with an awful lot in three years. Firstly, they didn't change any beliefs of the church. They just changed how some of these beliefs were expressed. The first, they highlighted the universal call to holiness. This means everyone, of every rank, is responsible for being and building the church. It was an emphasis on ordinary Catholics rather than on just priests and bishops. Second, the church should seek greater unity with all Christians and seek peace with other religions. Third, the church should seek to be involved in the modern world through advances such as communications technology. Fourth, the church's nature was re-evaluated. It must be a light to the world, bringing the truth of Christ to all. Fifth, scripture was emphasised as important. In particular, all Catholics, lay and religious, were encouraged to read the scripture for themselves. That said, Vatican II emphasised that tradition was also important. Finally, the Mass was emphasised as being super important, with a focus on lay participation. That's ordinary Catholics. So, how did it change the Church? The most visible changes for ordinary Catholics were found in the Mass. For example, most priests now face the people when celebrating Mass, emphasising the role of the lay people. Priests were permitted to say the Mass in the local language, rather than in Latin. Latin is still the official language of the Church and the liturgy, though. There are more scripture readings, and these are read by lay people. And lay people were tasked with preparing and leading prayers, in the prayers of the faithful, and in assisting at communion. All of these changes were designed to more fully involve ordinary Catholics in the Mass. Other changes included a softening of language when talking about non-Catholics and a more welcoming attitude towards cooperating with other Christian groups. 
the church adopted a clearer anti-war stance as a result of the catastrophe of World War II. And finally, Vatican II has also started a whole bunch of arguments, as will no doubt be seen in the comments section below this video. There are those who say we should pursue the spirit of the Council, meaning we should be more open to the world and less concerned with tradition. In contrast, there are those who say we should accept the literal decisions of the Council, but that tradition is important and should be preserved. So, hopefully you now know why the Council was called, who was there, what they decided, and how it changed the Church. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Now let me share with you how we're going to proceed next week. I didn't mention Pope Paul at all, did I? No. But since Pope... I keep thinking Pope Francis and it's Pope John. Since Pope John died before the end of the first session, Pope Paul was elected, and he opted to continue the council. We have a lot to thank him for, because he could have closed the council just the way it was first Vatican council was closed, but he didn't. Instead, he picked up what the first session did, and the council went on for three more sessions up until 1965. So next week, we're going to look at Pope Paul and his role in the Second Vatican Council. And we're also going to begin looking at the documents and the, um, the change of tradition. Not change of traditions, but it's altering traditions of the past so that they fit into the life of the present. So it'll be an exciting time next week, so too. So anyway, as you go out, I do have a handout for you. It's a brief biography of Pope John. And so you're welcome to take it. You're not going to be tested. <laughs> but you might be asked a question. And um, if you're interested in him, go to YouTube. If you have YouTube on your TV, your laptop, or your phone, there are a lot of good videos about Pope uh, John and Vatican II, but be careful what you watch about Vatican II, because in our video here, what did we hear? There are divisions, and we're feeling that division more and more, I think. Who wants tradition to, and who wants the spirit of tradition to come into the foe now, you know, where we are now, 2024. So. We'll look at those kinds of things that happen. But next week, we're going to the second session, and we're going to the beginning of the documents that have come out that have made an impact on who we are as Catholics and on the entire Christian world. So anyway, um, I just bid you good night, and thank you for coming, and God bless us all.